As a political scientist, I was impressed by his book, The Lesser Evil, about the complicated relation between terrorism and democracy. But I was almost struck by lightning when I saw and heard Michael in the Dutch television program Buitenhof on his new book, Consolation. At the beginning of the program, Michael told that he was invited to come to Utrecht to give a lecture at a choral festival. He didn't remember the content of the lecture, but his wife, and she's also here, she's sitting there, and he were impressed by the psalms and the choirs. He confessed, I'm not an expert on psalms, and I'm not religious, but I'm deeply moved through the words of the psalms. And it led to one of the central questions of his newest book. How is it possible that religion has a deep influence in a non-religious era? In my opinion, it is a great book about consolation. Consolation is needed in turbulent times, which we are facing now. I don't have to mention in this context personal needs. I don't have to mention the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. We need consolation. Thank you. After this first welcome, thank you, Jauke, let me shortly introduce uh, the background of the invitation uh, we got. My name is Hanneke Muttert, and together with colleagues, we are working on WEC and Zingeving, work and meaning, the relations between that, with a group of colleagues uh, at the Faculty of Theology and Religious Studies. Being scholars in religion with various disciplinary backgrounds like anthropology, sociology, philosophy, psychology, so, uh, psychology, oh, psychology. <laughs> it's a long, been a long day. Spiritual care, we are intrigued by current and historical developments in various working contexts. Why is work such an important identity marker nowadays? What is the impact of different working cultures in past and present? And to what extent do benchmarks like happiness and leadership really contribute? And what about their opposites? Last autumn, we were preparing a spring course on Werk and Zingeving, work and meaning, facing another lockdown with severe impact on work conditions and student life among many other things. And people kept on saying, we are really done with it. In Dutch, de rek is eruit. <laughs> Today, we still witness the consequences of severe symptoms and our political coping strategies. At the same time, nothing seems to be changed, not fundamentally. So what's the baseline reflection Hard times just come and go? At least we found our focus. How do people endure those times? How do they hold on, specifically at work? Well, and at that same time, a beautiful prep book popped up. It's the Dutch translation of On Consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. Well, we thought, one can always give it a try. We reached out. Three days later, we were online. And I can assure you, at the very moment that Michael Ignatieff agreed to join us in Groningen, at least our search for consolation was fulfilled <laughs> for the time. <laughs> Michael Ignatieff, we are really grateful that you're here. As a well-known writer, politician, historian, you enriched our world with your books, essays, and lectures. And in, in this project on consolation, 
you bring together many human sources from within our Western intellectual culture. Musicians, poets, biblical text writers, philosophers from the Stoic tradition, and ending up with a nurse working in palliative care, and by sharing some of your own grief narratives. With this book, you allow us to be listeners to those specific living human documents that might lead that we bear our own stories with suffering a bit more comfortable. But at the same time, you want to preserve space for those things that are inconsolable by their very nature. After your lecture, Brenda Matthijsen will lead the discussion. She is a leading expert on death rituals and natural burial places, and in that regard, also playfully known as our own Mrs. Death. <laughs> but for now, we first warmly invite you to share your findings. The floor is yours. Okay, boy, I'm talking down to you. This is a terrible temptation <laughs> to give you a stern Protestant lecture from the old days, you know, repent, repent of your sins. Um, look, it's a great uh, moment of pleasure for Susanna and I to be here. I think you get, you're beginning to get an idea why we like to spend so much time in your country. Um, you've been very welcoming, and some of the thinking that I've done about consolation really began here, as you were kind enough to say. Um, and uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, because the most interesting part of this is when I come down the stairs afterwards and we get into conversation, and I hope we have a, a great uh, discussion. Uh, and I'll be at your level, and so you can fire away. Um, but while I can now be pompous at a height and look down at you, I wanted to share something that uh, you're the first audience I've shared this with. Um, I've had uh, some thoughts, subsequent thoughts, to writing the book, <clears throat> and uh, you're the audience I'd like to share it with. So. This uh, talk, which isn't too long, so be patient, it's not too bad, um, is called The Spirit of the Staircase, Second Thoughts on Consolation. And it begins with a story about the great Enlightenment philosopher, Denis Diderot, who, as you know, was the inspiring figure behind the creation of the encyclopedia, which is in many ways, the origin of European human sciences. Extraordinary man. Anyway, one night in the 1770s, uh, as Denis Diderot tells us in his essay, The Paradox of the Actor, a wonderful text which I commend to you, Diderot attended a grand dinner in Paris at which one of his friends, at the end of the dinner, directed a cutting remark in his direction you know, the kind of back and forward between intellectuals who think they're super smart. When the company turned around the table and turned to hear what Diderot would reply, he fell into sheepish silence. And afterwards, as he came down the stairs uh, from that dinner, on his way home, he was feeling a little humiliated. It occurred to him suddenly what he should have said when he was upstairs. And it's this story, it's a famous story, that led to the coining of the term in French, esprit d'escalier. And in German, I think the phrase is treppenwitz. And I don't know what it is in Dutch, but you probably got something that you'll tell me. Um, it is mistranslated in English as the spirit of the staircase. But the mistranslation, the spirit, does capture what's uncanny about being at a loss for words 
and then feeling that weird surge into consciousness again when the words do come to you. One way to think about this story, by the way, is that it's a story of consolation. Diderot is consoling himself for a moment of deep social embarrassment, telling himself, well, in fact, I couldn't think of a smart thing to say to that smart-ass intellectual, but at least I thought of it now, before it was too late. Um, I begin with this story because writing a book can leave you with a feeling of esprit d'escalier, and such is the case with On Consolation, a book I worked on for a number of years. Writing books so often consumes the questions that led you to write them that you no longer want to return to them at all. You even forget what they were. But this isn't the case with consolation. Every time, as it were, I go down Diderot's stairs, I think of something I should have said when I was upstairs among all those brilliant figures who kept me company for four years. Cicero, Marcus Aurelius, St. Paul, Montaigne, Hume, Camus, and Primo Levi. And so coming down the stairs from Diderot's dinner party, another thing happened, which is after I published the book, I discovered a thinker that I didn't know about when I was in their company upstairs. It was as if I'd met a learned man as I walk home feeling slightly humiliated by what I should have said, and he engages me in conversation and gives me another reason why I regret what I should have said upstairs. And the man in question is someone you might know, um, a, f a famous German philosopher called Hans Blumenberg. He was a half-Jewish German philosopher born in 1920 who escaped extermination in 1944 and lived until 1996 as a professor in Bochum and then in Mun Munster. And he spent his whole career thinking about the meaning of secularization, which has already been mentioned. Um, secularization, he argued, left intact and unanswered the religious questions that are intrinsic to our situation as human beings. And it is in the search for answers to these questions that the need for consolation arises. Questions such as, why do we lose those we love? Why do we fail so miserably at what we dream of achieving? And why is the universe so constructed that these reversals are intrinsic to the experience of life? In an essay called On the Need for Consolation and the Unconsolable in Human Beings, which was published in 2006 after his death, Blumenberg says, we're the only creatures who need consolation and the only creatures capable of alleviating pain through symbolic representation. We cannot, when we console ourselves, take away the pain itself, because the pain has happened. But we can take away what Georg Simmel, another German sociologist, called, and this is a great phrase, the suffering about the suffering. And we'll think about the suffering about the suffering throughout this little talk of mine. Now, the question that Blumenberg helps me to pose and I want to discuss with you is whether consolation is in the domain of truth, that is, the realm of philosophy, or whether it's in the domain of rhetoric, by which I mean the domain of art. As you know, with Socrates and Plato, consolation remained firmly in the domain of philosophy. Socrates' death, as recounted by Plato, remains the most famous of all the attempts to die philosophically. And how does Socrates die? He attends to the truth of the experience in famous and unforgettable detail, the coldness in your fingers, uh, the numbness, the drowsiness that steal, steals over you as the hemlock begins to have its effect. In this account, uh, consolation is paired with truth, and to be consoled in this account is to be lucid in the face of the irremediable. Now, when the Romans take up this theme in Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, Seneca's Letters, philosophy continues this tradition, 
though I found when I read Seneca and Cicero that I found their stoic attempts to console people upon death singularly unconsoling. And one of the interesting parts of this story is that uh, I don't think they consoled Cicero either. It's a famous moment when Cicero, who's the great author of consoling rhetoric, suddenly loses his own daughter. And he's absolutely inconsolable. And I commend to you the tragic letters that Cicero wrote about his desperate grief in AD 40, in, in, in 45 BC, because they're some of the greatest letters about the loss of a loved one I've ever read, but they're utterly inconsolable. It's a moment in which the philosophy of consolation comes up against real grief and philosophy loses, is what I'm trying to say. The Romans may have believed that the purpose of philosophy was to teach us how to live and how to die, but propositional reasoning, it turns out, is rarely as soothing as a good story. If you look at a book that I wrote about in, the, in, the, in On Consolation, Boethius's Consolations of Philosophy, a Roman senator writing in 524 AD as he awaits execution at the hands of a barbarian king, the Consolations looks like an attempt to find consolation through philosophical reflection. But it's actually an exercise in storytelling. It's a dialogue that Boethius invents between himself, the prisoner awaiting execution, and an absolutely fantastic character called Lady Philosophy. Lady, he describes Lady Philosophy's clothes, he describes her wit, he describes his, her demeanor, he describes her jewelry. I mean, she's a real living person. And he conjures her into life, I think, to give him company as he awaits execution. Um, so it's the power of his own imagination when applied to his vast re repertoire of learning that enabled him to conjure up a sympathetic, if sardonic and critical listener, just like his wife, who was so real as to seem to be sharing his solitude and his dread. And Blumenberg um, wants us to understand that rhetorical fictions of this kind are just as consoling as philosophy. He writes, consolation is an exclusively human form of liberty we have in relation to reality. It's the freedom to ensure for ourselves the possibility of life, not through an actual removal of the suffering through a physical improvement, but to be able to do this also despite the unchanged continuation of reality, and to be able to do this ultimately through a fiction. Consolation is a story about where you're faced with something that you cannot change. You've got to come to terms with it, death, loss, failure. You can't change reality, but you can imagine it differently, is what he's saying. Now, philosophy would regard fictions as just pathetic strategies to avoid facing the truth. But Blumenberg significantly disagrees. Rhetoric cannot simply be disparaged if we can assume that man is predestined to it by his needs. It's not simply the art of demagogic lure. It has also had its meaning for forms of spiritual care and for the bringing about of a better disposition of mind and more joy of living. This is the key sentence. The fundamental error of all criticism of rhetoric is the assumption that the naked truth that is concealed by it would on its own suffice to cope with what is revealed. So don't disparage rhetoric. Don't think of it as you're avoiding the truth. You may not be able to face the truth, is what Bloomberg is telling you. Since we cannot cope with the truth of loss and failure, and since we want to recover the joy of living, we tell ourselves stories, knowing their stories. Diderot, to return to him, was fascinated by this human quality. We accept dialogue in a theater and the display of emotion conjured up by the actor's art as if it were real through what Coleridge famously called the willing suspension of disbelief. And that leads me to think, and I did not say this in the book, that consolation is a performance. It's a mistake, I think, to believe that consolation proceeds by proof 
It works through the art of persuasion. And in persuasion, it is the speaker and their rhetoric, not just the speech and its content, that does the persuading. Indeed, as I think you might register if you've ever been in a situation where you have been consoled, sometimes what people say to console us is less important than that they say it or say it well. In the performance of consolation, we, the audience, play a role. We're not passive spectators. We play a role. We both receive the words of consolation and we evaluate them. In the Jewish faith, when you sit Shiva, people come to you and they tell you touching stories, funny ones or sad ones, about the departed. And when they leave, you thank them for their presence, for the respect that they show by being there. And we are consoled by their presence, by their recognition, by their acknowledgement, without necessarily believing a word of what they've said about the departed. Right? And we, under, we, we live with this irony. Let me give you another more personal example. At the burial of my own father on a windswept hill in Quebec in 1989, an Orthodox priest came down from Montreal to officiate at the graveside in this small village church. And at the end, he led the singing of the Vyechnaya Pamyat. I don't speak Russian, but I knew what the words meant. They mean, eternal memory grant unto him, O Lord. We were consigning my father to the eternal memory of God. And I'll always remember singing those words over the whistling of the wind on the hillside. And the, com the consolation I felt was a composition, was a composite of many emotions. I felt we'd done right by him. We buried him as he would have wished beside his parents with the words that he would have wanted. And the fact that the priest's sneakers were peeking out beneath his liturgical gown was not a distraction or a breach of decorum, but somehow a symbol of the humble churches of exile in which my father had spent his life. And if I didn't actually believe that God's memory is eternal, it didn't matter, since it spoke powerfully to a longing that I had for my father, which is that he would not be forgotten. So even... When we console ourselves alone, that's a performance, a public performance, a burial. But even when we're alone with ourselves and we console ourselves for failure, we are also engaged in a performance. We have one inner voice that says, well, you did your best, while another inner voice whispers, really, are you sure? And this inner dialogue of doubt and reaffirmation can go on for years while we sustain ourselves with a consoling, with a consoling fiction until we accept that we won't actually ever know whether we gave it our best. <laughs> All that is absolutely certain is that our best wasn't good enough. And in that moment of admission, we get over it. The consoling fiction has done its work. We move on. A new chapter begins. I think we shouldn't be ashamed to turn to consoling fictions because facing any of the truths about life is hard. William Shakespeare understood this better than anybody when he has King Lear repeat over and over at the end of the play as he holds his dead daughter's body, never, 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 as if the truth keeps escaping him as if finality is more than he can bear or even understand. And in the next instant, as if he can't stand the implications of the words never, he thinks he sees her breathing. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look her lips. Look there. Look there. And then he dies. So Lear dies, Lear dies believing not that she's gone forever, but that she might still be alive. And when we struggle with unbearable truth, we resort to fictions which we half know to be false, but which help us at least to get through to the next moment and the next until nothing hurts quite the way it did. Now, at this point, my philosopher friends would say that consolation that's dependent upon fiction is no consolation at all. 
Philosophers are the custodians and caretakers of one of the most noble ethics of modernity. Be not deceived by your own illusions. And hence their deep reluctance about the very idea of consolation. Reconciliation with the facts, yes. Acceptance of the truth, however hard. Lucidity is the goal, whether it's consoling or not. In defending lucidity as the goal we should seek in relation to suffering, philosophy has to hold the line against succumbing to yearnings for meaning, which philosophy believes are not to be found. For these and other reasons, philosophy has vacated the terrain of consolation, at least since David Hume, and left it to the domain of psychology, uh, psychoanalysis, and religion. Yet the question of consolation doesn't go away just because philosophers find it intractable. For we continue to be consoled by propositions we do not happen to believe. We read the Psalms, or at least I do, and feel solace and kinship with their descriptions of spiritual yearning and loneliness. We listen to religious music and feel deep consolation from work that was composed to glorify a God in which we do not believe. So why is this so? How does this become possible? When we think about consolation, I think we're thinking about the same question that Diderot asked in The Paradox of the Actor. Why performances exert such a cathartic effect upon us, even when we know that they're an exercise in rhetoric. Diderot picked this up, by the way, it's one of the most attractive parts of Diderot, by spending hours in the dressing rooms of the great actresses of his era. And he thought they were serious creative artists. And so he was smart enough to listen to these women, tell them, tell him how they achieve their stage effects. <clears throat> and, they, and they told him that actors do not express their emotions. They produce them to serve a text. They perform the emotions, preferably with an icy heart. In the theater, rhetoric produces an effect independent of and despite the truth. The actor imitates sincerity, plays at being authentic without being at least bit authentic. So by analogy, when we listen to Mozart's Requiem or Bach's Matthew Passion, we suspend disbelief as we do in the theater. We discard the question whether we believe in the doctrines these magnificent pieces of religious music depict and instead surrender to the impact their performance has upon our emotions. And whether we think Christian doctrine is true or not seems irrelevant to their power to console. So this leaves a non-believer like myself in a supposedly secularized world, and I guess I'm saying it's much less secular than we suppose. This leaves a non-believer seeking to have it both ways, refusing assent to doctrines that no longer convince reason, while holding on to the rhetoric of religious consolation, since secular life has no substitute. So this makes us, this then poses another question. If an unbeliever does not believe in religious doctrine, does he or she have a right to be consoled by religious rhetoric. Why not, one might reply. I mean, when we go to the cinema or the theater, we don't ask permission when we start crying. We just cry. We should, why should we be required to justify the consolations we derive from traditions that are no longer ours by conviction? The reason might be that consolation is something more than comfort more than catharsis, more than two hours in a movie theater. It's a settled state of belief. For consolation to be enduring, it must be truthful and it must convince. Yet here I think we learn something about how we think about our emotions. Because as anyone who has actually cried in the cinema or the theater, and I cry easily in both, conviction actually structures our emotional responses. We don't just surrender. We evaluate, and emotions must convince us just as surely as propositions must. As a story unfolds on the screen or the stage, we have a whole arsenal of terms, negative terms. We call a, a scene kitsch 
or we call a scene maudlin, or we call a scene sentimental. And those are our ways to detect and ward off manipulation of our, of our feelings. In other words, even when watching a performance, we are concerned with the issue of emotional truth. And rightly so, because we don't want to be manipulated. The performers we love, the performances we remember, the ones that do console us, seem to us to be truthful. They do not manipulate. They illuminate. In fact, they define for us what pathos is, what tragedy is, what comfort and solace sound and look like. And so if you have difficulty understanding what pathos means, I can put on Alfred Brendel playing Schubert, and I know what pathos is, right? We assess, we evaluate the truth of these experiences, and great performers teach us what the truth of our emotions are. So I need to revise my original question about whether consolation dwells in the domain of philosophical truth or in the domain of rhetoric and emotion. I think they dwell in both realms because in both, reason and emotion are at work together. In both, the question of truth is urgent for us. We question our beliefs, but we also question our emotions. And we will only accept consolations from beliefs and emotions which ring true to us. Another test of truth in the experience of consolation is whether we trust those who try to console us. Consolation is a social act. It's the deepest test of human solidarity. And it's a test of trust at the most intimate level. When we're grieving, we do ask ourselves, are these people who've come to console us for my loss actually understanding what I'm going through? It's a question we ask of them. Even in grief and loss, we do this, and for the same reason that we check our emotions at the theater or the cinema. We don't want to be manipulated, especially not when we're looking into the abyss. Consolation, in other words, depends on psychic attributes that distinguish human beings as such, namely empathy, the capacity to imagine another person's state of mind and to act out for them expressions of sympathy that relieve their suffering. But even empathy is open to evaluation because empathy, the display of empathy by another person, is a performative and iterative process. The mourner assesses whether their words of comfort are getting through. The grieving person evaluates whether they should trust these words. So to be consoled is to trust, to believe, and then to surrender to the emotions of another because you believe them to be true. That this is a performance doesn't make it any less real, any less foundational to the maintenance of the predictable moral world on which we all depend. I'm coming to a conclusion. We can, I'll be downstairs in just a minute. Thinking about consolation illuminates the complex relation between thought and feeling, between truth and fiction. And it takes us into the unappeasable, insatiable heart of our species. We don't just suffer pain. We suffer about the suffering. We ask questions about why we must suffer, why existence is as it is, and why life does not live up to our hopes and expectations. And in our search for meaning, we trust neither our emotions nor our reason, nor the emotions or reasons of those who come to our aid. We evaluate constantly in both the emotional and rational modes, seeking as best we can to attain emotional and rational truth alike. For we would like to be sovereign. We do not want to be manipulated by ourselves or anyone else. Yet the truth, we also know, escapes us because the truth is hard to bear. We do not want to be crushed by the truth of life we want to live and recover the joy of living, and we want to live in hope. So to bear what must be born, we settle, at least temporarily, for fables, for inventions, for narratives that help us to remain hopeful in the face of facts that include death and dying, failure and loss, Ukraine, pandemics, 
and all the rest. To think about consolation, I now see, is to venture into the domain of philosophical anthropology and to try to understand the ways in which both truth and rhetoric, philosophy and art, have served to give us whatever purchase we ever have over who we are as human beings. For we are not only performers on the stage of life, but performers who seek to make sense of the performance, to understand it both from the inside but also from the outside, and to grasp the rationale of those rituals of consolation that we enact to take away our dread and our sorrow. As Diderot understood, we often grasp the meaning of the performance only after it's over, when it's too late to change anything. But then it's always good to learn, even on the staircase. Here, I think. Yes. Perfect. Right. Thank you so much for that inspiring lecture, and thank you for coming up with a different idea, second thoughts. It's always a good thing for discussion. Also always a good thing when preparing a lecture and having first thoughts, but now I'm having second thoughts as well, thanks to this wonderful talk. Um, I want to invite all of you to think about questions you would like to ask uh, Michael, but I want to start with one uh, question, so you have some time well, to think or to experience, uh, as we've just heard. Um, I would like to invite you to reflect upon your own practice as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, you just uh, said, or you just questioned, whether consolation finds itself in the domain of art, or the body, or experience or the domain of philosophy, the mind, the ratio. And then you said, well, possibly it's both, right? Consolation moves between those two domains. When you are writing a philosophical book, such as Unconsolation, where do you find yourself? Is the writing and consoling practice in terms of art, or is it an intellectual no. treaty? Well, I think this piece amounts to a rethinking of that question. I think if I'd thought about, answered the question a couple of years ago, I would have thought differently. Um, I've never enjoyed anything so much as writing this book. And it's about a very gloomy subject, so go figure, I can't. Or it's about a difficult subject. Um, I think the strongest emotion I had came through very slowly, which was, um, an almost palpable physical sense of keeping company with the departed dead. I don't want to sound pretentious about it, but if you, anybody who loves these figures, Marcus Aurelius, Cicero, Montaigne, particularly Montaigne, um, and you spend a lot of time with them, you, you almost can hear them speak to you. And part of one of the, the messages of the book is um, we're not alone and we never have been. I mean, it's as simple as that. That is the, the worst experience we have when we lose someone we love or when we are betrayed in a love relationship or when we um, fail at something that matters terribly to us is a sense of solitude, a sense of shame, a sense of wanting to withdraw, a sense of wanting to be alone. And part of writing this book was tremendously consoling in the sense I spent time with people much, much wiser than me, you know, years with them, you know, and, and began to get as almost to hear them. So, um, and the writing of it out clearly, which is where your question is going, was consoling in the sense that I, I felt I could convey to myself and then to an audience I understand you, you know, 
I know what you're saying, I get you, you know. Um, and so I felt it was not just hearing the voices of the departed dead, but actually speaking back to them in some strange way. Um, I don't want to get, I'm at the edge of being more pretentious than even I can stand, but I, I am trying to answer honestly why, why it was so much fun and why I actually hope that readers will find it good. I, the other thing I wanted to do in the book was to get away from texts. One of the things I think is wrong about the way we teach all this stuff to our students is we don't locate it in lives. I mean, people really, you know, in one concrete example, people have been reading Marcus Aurelius's meditations and assigning in philosophy courses for about 2,000 years. And almost everybody misses a little note on one of the one of the um, these little notes uh, that he because he wrote them in Greek. They're twelve little scrolls, and one of them says that he wrote it in Vindobana. Well, once you know that, you know everything about this text. He's fighting a guerrilla war on the Danube frontier. And he's been fighting a guerrilla war on the Danube frontier for 15 years. He's 55 years old. He's exhausted. He's supposed to be the philosopher king. He was supposed to, you know, you know, give lectures like this and have a nice time. Instead, he's fighting this brutal, repulsive counter-terror war. It's as awful as you can imagine. He talks about severed limbs and broken bodies. A sense of disgust radiates through the text. And when you see him as being a counterinsurgency warrior at the end of his tether with only a couple of years to live, you suddenly understand the text, in my view. It's not this serene, calm, Olympian, stoic text which then gets trotted out to undergraduates forever. It's the anguished testimony of a political leader struggling to hold it together. And the text is very uneven. It's as uneven as your diary. I mean, sometimes your diary is up, happy, cheerful. You have a good thing to say. The next day, without any interruption, your diary is down, low, depressed, worried. I'm making this up. I have no idea. <laughs> and and it, that's like Marcus Aurelius's text. It's discontinuous. It's broken up. The guy is writing late at night. The rector knows this. If you're, if you're in a big job, you can't confess to anybody, right? The emperor, the most powerful man in the world, can't talk to anybody because he can't trust anybody. So he has to talk to himself. And that then makes it an exercise in consolation. So that's an example of what I was trying to do and, and in other words, enter into these lives with them. I wonder also in relation to this example, um, one of the things you mentioned in your talk was this idea of authenticity, that it's important to, to do something that's authentic or that you can understand. Um, but I guess in this example you just mentioned, I don't think he would have thought, well, am I being authentic, right? It's not a concern. So sometimes, perhaps, it might not be only about thinking, um, but by doing something. and not asking whether it's authentic, it perhaps doesn't matter, mm. but by doing something, you might actually be able to participate in something that's larger than oneself, mm -hmm. and then find solidarity in that. So for example, um, one of the things that we study at the Center for Religion, Health and Wellbeing are practices and rituals uh, surrounding the end of life and surrounding death. And one of the things that people find in these practices, also the discursive practices of other traditions, traditions that they don't, mm -hmm. that perhaps belong to themselves, is this sense of shared comradeship. Mm -hmm. The sense that they can do something and celebrate or um, experience something, memorialize something, feel something with others. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't believe what it said, what is being said up front yes. in a church or a mosque, it, and actually it doesn't matter, <laughs> it's about the fact that everyone performs yes. that act. Yes, there are two dimensions to this. I think you, 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 you put your finger on it. When I, when I ask myself, 
how would I like to be buried? I, I would be uncomfortable mm. to be buried without some religious words. I'm a little undetermined about where that word <laughs> should be spoken, you know, but I, the idea that we wouldn't have, you know, Psalm 23 or something, or I mean, we wouldn't have some things, or we wouldn't have some beautiful music. Would, um, and I think what's going on is you want to create a space where you share in present time the solidarity with others. Um, I mean, the worst, the worst thing in the world are are those terrible funerals you occasionally see where there's no one there. You know, some guy has died alone on the street and he's given a Christian burial, but no one shows up. There's something that I think horrifies everybody about that, the loneliness of that. And so you, the rituals are to create that sense of being together. The thing I want to add to the story is that we want to be connected in deep time. I mean, I, I just feel that um, we need to always hold on to the fact that you know, when Cicero loses his daughter, it is exactly what it is like to lose a daughter in 2022. There isn't much damn difference. We are the exact contemporaries of these people in moments of extremity. And I think that one of the ideas about secularization that I don't like is we're kind of marooned in this modernity. You know, it's 2022. We've never been in this kind of world before. Nobody's ever experienced what we're experiencing. It's all so new. These cell phones are new. I mean, you know, give me a break with this. Much of what is, you know, consequential about life has not changed in 2,000 years. And it's useful to remember that because it means that there are lots of resources back there you can turn to. You know, I teach this stuff, and I'm not teaching a kid's a canon. I'm saying something completely different. You're not alone. There are resources here. They go back to the first moment people, you know, you know, etched a sign in cuneiform on wet clay in, you know, in Assyria 5,000 years ago. And, and that sense of a, the, the deep continuity of human experience is a, is a kind of passionate feeling I have, which I was trying kind of inadequately to express in this book. The objective is not to reduce you to stunned silence. I wear. Thank you for your uh, thoughts and your um, reflections upon well what you have been writing before and. Uh, what you have learned now uh, and with the uh, additional questions that were asked. Uh, while you were speaking, um, I felt some discomfort at times because uh, you speak about these great philosophers that have been thinking about these uh, uh, great things and have written these wonderful texts uh, that we are able to reflect upon. Um, but your talk reminded me of research uh, we have done also together with our spiritual care students on uh, patients uh, with cancer or uh, who were in our first uh, uh, wave of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and one of the things that keeps returning in their stories is that they find great consolation in returning to work. Uh, we've heard about work and meaning in the beginning of, uh, of this evening. Um, but what I find in their descriptions is that the consolation that they find in, in going back to work and spending time at work is really much more about being able to do things and to perform and to... Um, I don't know, feel useful in some way and to feel like, you know, they are returning to some way of functioning that they were before, which might not have much to do about, oh, sure. you know, reflections upon the meaning of life and uh, all of these yeah. things. How, yeah. how, how does that fit into your 
thoughts about this uh, topic? I think that's a great challenge. You're saying don't intellectualize. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good luck with that one. <laughs> I plead guilty. Um, no, I think it's a it's a it's a it's an excellent uh, challenge if you if um, to work through your way of thinking. If I was very sick, and thank God I've had very few moments of serious illness, number one priority is to get back to work. Number one priority is to be useful, even if it means going out and taking the laundry. You know, just get back into a day in which I do things. I'm moving through space. All that stuff. I think there's no question about it. And work is also being part of a team. You know, being being part of a group of people that you, from where you derive your esteem, esteem and self worth, and the people you kid with, the people you can't stand but get along with, all the complex things about work. I, I think there's no question that, that that is the frame that gives many people, including me, the, the meaning of life. I want to keep teaching, for example, as long as they'll have me, just because it's not for the students, it's for me. <laughs> so I, I think that's very, very true. Um, I include in the, in the book, the last chapter is devoted to a social worker, a medical nurse called Cicely Saunders, who some of you may know because she invented the hospice movement. And I included her partly as a kind of to set against the highly intellectual character of what I was doing. Here was a woman who spent 40 years of her nursing life nursing dying patients. And she's extremely interesting about it. Um, she was a rare person who, you know, had read her Camus, who had read her T.A.R. de Chardin. She was highly intellectual person, but she had this genius for putting it into practical application. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that she says about dying, which has stayed with me, is that she noticed how many of her dying patients wanted to use their dying for some purpose. That is to console their own family members. And she saw this over and over again, people saying, well, I want a few weeks uh, to be with my people. And what that actually meant was, don't be frightened. I'm going through this, it's not so bad, right? So purposeful, purposive activity, even at the last moment, extraordinary, and, and, and to me, deeply inspiring. Um, so, uh, you're quite, you're, you're quite right. But I, want to, I, I don't want to be too apologetic for being hopeless intellectual because I still think reading Camus and Cicero and Marcus Aurelius is a pretty good thing to do. But the other thing I would say is this is certainly not a how-to manual. You know, if you're having a hard time, I do not advise you to go and buy this book and think it's going to tide you over a tough time. That's not what I wrote it for. You know, I just, there are other wonderful books that do that and are much more practical advice. I just, that's so far above my abilities, I wouldn't even try. I would like to go on a little bit on the uh, former topic, probably. Um, I realize I didn't read your book yet, so that's an omission. Well, the exam's on Monday, so you better get it. <laughs> still have the chance. <laughs> um, but I realized from, from your lecture today that you're um, uh, exalting yourself as a scholar, and that you are very much all have to do with words. Mm -hmm. so Power of music. Yes. 
I have two, it's a wonderful question. I have two chapters specifically devoted to it. One of them is, um, my wife and I went to Toledo in Spain. And in Toledo, in the a little church on a side street, there is El Greco's greatest painting, which is the death of Count Orgaz. It's about the size of one of these back panels, maybe even bigger. It's a huge painting. Um, no words, but it's one of the greatest depictions of the Christian vision of time past, time present, and time future fused together by hope of the resurrection. It's just a fantastic painting. And when you decode it that way, you see how deeply consoling it was. And not a word is, not a word is spoken. And it was very consoling to the Toledans. They came out in droves to see it because they thought, this is my world. This is what I believe. You know, and it was, they, so that's one example. On the musical side, I, I devote a chapter to uh, Gustav Mahler's Kindertoten Lieder, Songs on the Death of Children, which some of you may know are among the most beautiful and haunting uh, orchestral songs that he ever wrote. And the biographical thing, of course, that is haunting about them is that he, uh, as a young poor boy in Moravia, uh, lost three of his brothers in infancy, so he knew about child death intimately in his own life. And I think that's why the theme of the death of children was a theme that he wanted to set to music. Um, but the, the, the cruel irony of the story, of course, is that he, he wrote some of the songs before he had a child of his own, and then had a child of his own, and the child caught, yeah, uh, caught uh, scarlet fever and died at the age of four or five. And it was a blow, I think, that destroyed his, I think destroyed his marriage and he never, he never recovered. And he said one thing about this, which I thought was a, a key to understanding consolation. He said to one of his friends, um, I could write those songs Marie died, but once she died, I couldn't write them ever again. And that tells you something about the inconsolable and the limits of art as consolation. Um, in the death of a child, his, the capacity of music to console met its match, although he'd written... Um, these are astonishing songs, and the last song ends on a long, one of those long, fading cadences that Mahler made his own, which, as a, someone said, is like feeling your mother's hand on your head. You know? Deeply consoling music, but only possible before the full impact of personal loss had hit him. So... Um, and I do think that music um, has a power to console precisely because it's wordless. That's the point. Uh, it proceeds without words and, and works. It's a form of rhetoric. It, you know, it has, a, it has a, an order and a system. I'm not a musicologist. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I wrote this piece, to kind of acknowledge the ways in which the rhetoric of art has effects that often go much deeper than, than propositions, so. I think this also reminds me of another distinction that you make in the, in the book between, <coughs> between consolation and comfort. Um, so for example, the, question, the, the example of music, um, if you find yourself inconsolable, is music then there only to bring you comfort? Is, is comfort all you can find when you are inconsolable? Yeah, I, I, I try in the book to distinguish between comfort and consolation. Comfort, um, 
comfort is not propositional, and it's not an exchange of meanings. If you were crying now, and I knew you well enough, I would comfort you by putting my arm around you if that was appropriate. I don't know whether it would. I would do something that would just say, I see what's happening. I, I recognize that what you're going through. Yeah, I would acknowledge. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, unless I knew you much better, attempt to console you by saying something about what's happened and try and give it some meaning. Um, so comfort is kind of physical, and consolation has a kind of. I was saying before a propositional quality to it, but now it seems to also have a rhetorical quality. Um, it's not only what you say, but how you say it and when you say it. The rhetorical and performance setting of consolation is much more important, I think, th than my rather dry, hyper-intellectual version of it in the book. Okay, that's why I gave this talk tonight, to rethink some of this stuff. Anyone else? I don't see questions in the back. Uh, I'm not hearing well, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. I think. Okay, thank you so much for the insights and the different perspective on consolation first. So, um, I thought about your sentence when you said, We are performer and performer to understand the performance at the same time. And um, we only grasp the meaning after it's over. So, but it's good to learn. And I actually have the question if humans really can learn by acting how they act. Because I thought um, people try, like I thought about the term consolation, and people try to find consolation at the, same at the same time as they are basically too late. So this means you would find consolation in hoping it will not happen, like in the worst case, but also to achieve that status of hope and ignorance. And... Um, Therefore, there is a parallel of hoping for a better world, but and as well ignoring the, the real world. And you talked about fiction, so I, I'm wondering if that's not a fiction to ignore the world, how it really is. And then the question would be, if we can really learn. I'm glad you're putting the idea of fictions under some pressure. That's what you're doing. Um, you know, on a night when our fellow Europeans are fighting for their lives in Ukraine, it's a little hard to push reality away. And it's quite important not to indulge in hopeful fantasies about that situation. Um, uh, it's pretty important to be lucid and see it for what it is. And I think it's important not to draw consolation from it. There is a narrative out there that this is the great epical battle between democracy and tyranny, for example. That's a story out there. That seems a, a narrative that has got too much weight to bear. Ukrainians didn't choose this bloody battle. They don't want to be the representatives of the whole world. They just want to go back to their lives and not be shelled and have their sons and daughters murdered. Um, and then when you frame it as a battle between democracy and authoritarianism, that you then start projecting it into the future. This is the great battle of our time, and we know how that battle must end. It must end with a, with a victory of this, this, um, a free meeting like this. Uh, the democratic culture that's enshrined in these halls must win. We don't know. We don't know whether it's going to win. We do not know. So we want to be lucid and refuse consolatory narratives that are fictions that keep our hopes up. Um, we want to stick close to the facts, and the facts are that a people whom, when I was in Ukraine in 1992, I remember thinking vividly, this isn't a nation. This is a bunch of individuals. This is, what the hell is going on here? 
how wrong I was. 2022, this is a people fighting to survive. And those are facts you can hold on to. This is, this is a people constituted through suffering and adversity, constituted by the hatred of a regime, fully capable of doing something extremely complicated, which is they've lived with Russians all their lives, most of them speak Russian, and they're able to dis disaggregate between the Putin regime and Russians. Incredible achievement, morally, in my view. The question of whether they can keep that going is an open question, especially if you've just had someone massacred close to you by a Russian soldier. You may stop making that differentiation between the regime and the... So, you know, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in what's called the commentariat. I do commentary on this war. And I think there's a tremendous amount of loose talk. We're trying to create narratives of hope uh, that may take us far beyond the facts. Um, give you an example, a, a little historical example of this. It has been very frequent in the commentary for historians to say this recalls the Finnish resistance to the Soviet invasion of Finland in 3940. True, <laughs> except that people forget that when it ended, the president of Finland who signed the accord ceding Karelia to the Soviet government said, may my hand wither that signed this document. In other words, if you analogize between the Finnish case and the Ukrainian case, one conclusion you might well draw is that Zelensky will have a moment in which he wishes his hand would wither from the peace that he will have to sign to save whatever can be saved. And everybody will then have an opinion about whether that peace is a peace with justice or just peace, right? So we're in the middle of this. I guess as a historian, my sense is we won't, we won't know what narrative is true for 50 years. The one thing we ought to be very careful about is narratives of hope and, and false consolation. I may not be responding directly to what you said. I hope I was a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, maybe two more, and then I gotta stop. I'm done. Uh, maybe two more, and then I should stop. Thank you for the yep. wonderful talk. Um, I probably would like to keep pushing you further on the similar front. So, I wanted to ask uh, how important you think it is to derive consolation specifically from sources that would be considered more truthful, most importantly, but also secular, keeping on the topic maybe of uh, how you think about death and um, so as not to make it political and uh, yeah, uh, the need to avoid the concept of death in Western society mm -hmm. and in religion most prominently can lead to ideologies that are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's very important to emphasize consolation through truth yeah. and also possibly secularism but not mm. necessarily because I think the answers you can find there not only are more truthful and therefore better in a way mm -hmm. um, but they also aren't bleak and nihilistic they can bring mm. joy and mm -hmm. fun to life just as well as other sources can mm -hmm. yeah I don't I think I'm trying to say maybe it's the Canadian liberal in me the finding the middle equivocal middle ground here um, if you're telling me that there are some very powerful secular accounts of death and dying and very powerful secular accounts of what life is for and what it means who am I to disagree I don't I, I share many of those views. Um, I mean, give you an example. I, I think one of the things that is astounding about modern society, and you see it in the, the young people I teach, 
is how frequently they believe that uh, they want to make a difference and they want to make a difference for people less fortunate than themselves, whether they're in their own countries or overseas. That is a rhetoric of, and a commitment, not just a rhetoric, but a commitment to social justice literally gives a lot of the students I know a reason to live. That would be, if I'm parsing you right, an example of what you mean, a purely secular account that the purpose of life is to make it better for all of us in little ways. That's what we're here to do. And, and imperfectly, uh, post-1945 societies have lived that ethic. Um, and so that seems absolutely fine to me. Um, there's a second aspect of this that I didn't talk about, but you may be at the edge of talking about, which is that there's, out of that social justice rhetoric, that social justice ideal, which goes back to the Enlightenment and then goes forward to Marx and then goes forward into socialism, so democracy, there is an angry battle against consolation. The purpose of life is not to be consoled not change. The purpose of life is to change life, right? Remember Marx? Marx wasn't wrong about that. So the rebellion against consolation is a tremendous part of our, of, of our inheritance. And we link it to the idea of truth. And we should. This book is not seeking to re- <laughs> acquaint the world with the lost treasures of religious thought. It's actually doing something different, which is to say there are two streams that come into the West. One of them is religious and organized around an idea of consolation. And the other is deeply secular and deeply hostile to the idea of consolation. That's why my book has a long chapter about Karl Marx and a long chapter about Condorcet. Condorcet is, you know, the greatest mathematician of his time, under uh, prosecution by the French Revolution, hiding from uh, possible arrest and execution, and he writes the most famous sketch of the progress of the human mind ever written. This is a work, a great work of consolation whose purpose is to say life has meaning because science and technology are guiding us on a path towards a future of greater freedom, greater knowledge, greater control over nature. And I, Marquis de Condorcet, awaiting death, may not see that world, but I believe it will happen, right? It's the great secular narrative, but it's a narrative of consolation. No question about it. Um, and you feel that it's a rhetoric of consolation for a controversial reason, which is <clears throat> it's a rhetoric of, of progress that imagines progress as the conquest and domination of nature. Well, we know where that's got us, right? So um, this is a book that ends up saying, I think perhaps a little darkly, there are no generalized ideologies of consolation, either secular or religious, that will help you in an hour of desperation. What will help you in an hour of desperation is your fellow human beings. And in that sense, I'm less intellectualist than you might suppose. The book ends saying, we are not consoled by doctrines, we're consoled by people real people here and now. And if you haven't got people around you to console you, then, then you have a problem. You don't need, we don't need an, another ideology of progress. We don't need another vision of, of a communist radiant tomorrow. I mean, if, if you're asking me, if you're pushing me, what do I believe I want my, my, my students to, to adopt as a life orientation? Make a difference to someone else. 
get down there and make a difference. Very banal, very ordinary stuff. I don't think there's a big picture story I can give them. Care for others. I mean, you know, it says, I'm happy to end on a really banal note. That's where I, <laughs> a really boring, banal note. All right. So. I will speak here, so everyone can hear. Thank you so much for those reflections. I wouldn't say it's a banal note, I would say it's a MED <laughs> note, and MED then is an acronym for making a difference. Right? So please think how you can all be MED in your lives. Make a difference. Um, a small token of our grat gratitude, it's a gift from the skies. That's the hint uh, from a Dutch altar, and we hope you will oh, thank enjoy you. it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, as you will know, Michael Ignacek will sign uh, books just outdoor here. And um, well, we hope to see you there. I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you.